Anybody need some renewal? Anybody think that the people of God, the Church of Jesus Christ, needs some renewal? Anybody feel like our country needs some renewal? Must just be me. The rest of you obviously are not with me on this. But well, well, here is where renewal begins. It begins with this truth. Every day you make an offering. You made an offering yesterday. You made an offering today. And whether you want to or not, tomorrow you are going to make an offering. And the offering you're going to make is a living sacrifice, a living offering. That is to say, you are going to give yourself to something. You, you are going to give your best energy, your best thought, your passion. You, you are going to give your time, which may be the most valuable thing you have, your resources to something. And it may be a noble thing. It may be a thing that's misguided. But, but you are giving yourself to something. And, and one of the things we're going to discover deeply in this next season, because I truly believe that over this next year, for many of us who will hear the voice of God and respond to the voice of God, God is going to do a deep work of renewal. It, it, it actually begins by asking yourselves the question, what are we offering ourselves to? What are we giving ourselves to? Every day, what are we giving ourselves to? Because, because here's, here's the, the truth. What we are offering ourselves, not just, not just, not just uh, uh, partly, but what we are giving our, our first and our best to, that is what we worship. And if we get messed up on what we worship, on what we are offering ourselves uh, to, then, then we, are, we are finding ourselves messing up our lives. And, 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 and this is what the book of Malachi is all about. It's about understanding this thing of what it means to offer our first and best to God. So, so let's just take a minute. I just want to have a word of prayer. And so, so let's just calm ourselves and quiet ourselves for a minute, just working from the assumption that God wants to speak, that he has something to say to each one of us, and that if we would just slow down, we could hear him. So, so let's just quiet ourselves. And, and, and Holy Spirit, I just ask you to fill this moment because we need renewal. We, we need refreshment. We need a return to God. And we need you to meet us in this conversation about what we are giving our first and best to. And, and we need you to just challenge us in the deepest level. Father, we are aware of the scripture that is repeated over and over again in the scriptures. Today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your heart. You did not say that once, but you said it over and over again today. If you hear my voice, do not harden your heart. Holy Spirit, do a work of breaking through our apathy, our self-satisfaction, our indifference. Break through our, our pain and our hurt. Break through and speak to our heart in the deepest places from your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, we're in this book of Malachi, and for those of you who have taken the time to read it, one dude who, who read it after I challenged the first week came back and said, dang, whew, that's all he said, and then walked away. I mean, it was just that kind of conversation, Malachi, right? It, you realize that this is not the, 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 the shallow end of the pool. This is not softball stuff. This is the kind of stuff that is by nature confrontational, challenging. It's the kind of thing that causes us, if we will take the book seriously, to get down to the beginning, the core, first principles, foundational stuff. And, and we've been seeing that in the, the, the weeks. We've been understanding that what's been going on in the book of Malachi is this, is that in, in an age of complacency and polluted worship, there is a rem that fears the Lord and stays faithful to keeping a book of remembrance. And that's basically what it means is this, is that Malachi was written about a hundred years or so, give or take, after a time of great renewal, great revival, a time where God's power was just working through his people. And now there's been a couple generations who have gotten used to the blessing that has come from their ancestors a long
aligning themselves to the things of God, and they become indifferent about it. They become half-hearted about it. They have become uh, uh, casual about what they are worshiping, and they've begun to offer their first and their best to something other than the true God. These are people who have lost the fear, the reverence, the awe of God. And he says, he says, he says in, in that time, there is a time where others come back to what's called a book of remembrance. And that's this understanding that, that God, it's, it's a metaphor, has a book where he is remembering those who are faithful. Those ones who have made him the first and the best, who have offered their first and best to God. Now what has made this especially tricky is the new brand of idolatry. Idolatry is anytime we put anything before God. And this new brand of idolatry is not only insidious and super tricky, but it's also the kind of idolatry we have today. So let's take a look again just at this new idolatry. It's the new idolatry was not worshiping false gods, so it's not like the Old Testament, you know, you know, statues and, and uh, Asherah poles and Baals and Molachs and all those things that got them in so much trouble. It was not the blatant turning your back on God to worship something that clearly is not God. It's not the rejection of Jehovah or Yahweh or the true God. This is more insidious. It's not that kind of thing. It's not worshiping false gods like Baal, but rather the idolatry, listen now, of half hearted worship of the true God, Yahweh. That is to say they did the right rituals, used the right words, they believed the right statements of faith, but it was half-hearted, it was half-baked. It was not real, it was not deep, and it was causing all kinds of problems. This idolatry created a complacency and a lukewarm devotion to God that is expressed in polluted worship. That is to say, worship that is second-rate, half-hearted, an afterthought, casual, every now and again, rather than the worship of God being me offering God my first and my best in all things. That God is not part of my life. God is not someone who gave me life. Jesus Christ and God the Father, they, God is my life. Because when God becomes my life, everything changes. Half-hearted worship has the opposite effect. It, it, it creates a polluted worship, inadequate sacrifices. One of the things we're going to be talking a lot about this fall is, is what we're offering ourselves, what we are sacrificing ourselves to, what are we giving ourselves to? Because you are giving yourself to something. And if you give yourself to the wrong kinds of things, it's going to lead to chaos and destruction and in a distant relation with God and everyone else. If you make the right sacrifices in the right way, it, it, it's fabulous, it's glorious, the healing, the renewal that can take place. But these sacrifices were inadequate. The glorification of evil, that is to say that, that when we start worshiping God on the side and he doesn't define our life, he's just over there, here's what it does. It says, okay, I'm good with God because I believe the right thing and I've got my fire insurance to keep me out of hell someday and, and that's part of my life and it's got over here. But I'm going to let all this other evil stuff come in my life. And you know what? At first it bothered me a little bit, but now I've gotten used to it. And I've actually gotten to the point, and we, we really need to do an inventory on how we as followers of Christ do this. There are things in our life that are completely inconsistent with the rule and reign of God that I have started to call good, but they're actually evil. So half-hearted worship inoculates us. It protects us from the conviction of the Holy Spirit about these evil things. And so evil things come into our lives. They come into our families. They come into our society. They come into our churches. And, and, and we become polluted, watered down, okay? A glorification, and look, at an oppression of the vulnerable. Because that's the other thing that happens, is that when we start living by the principle of the world, more and more, the oppression of people starts happening. Because, listen... Any God, it, other than the true God, any false God is a cruel God. And the meanest God, the worst God, the most oppressive God is the God, uh, is the, the half-hearted worship of the true God called Christianity. Because when a form of Christianity that is not about Jesus, is not about his principles, is not about him being Lord of our life, when that gets established in our life, it becomes hypocritical, it becomes abusive. It is the thing that allows ministers to steal money and abuse children. It is the things that cause us to rationalize witch hunts and crusades. See, this is not just, hey, we really need to get serious about God. This is half-hearted worship is, is destructive. That's why the book of Malachi is so hard-hitting. That's why he's saying, you know what? 
if, if you're going to come to me, even though you're saying the right things, doing the right rituals, believing the right statements of faith, but it's half-hearted, it's halfway, he said, it would be better for you to put out the fires in the altar. It'd be better for you to shut the doors. It'd be better for you to not even do it at all because this kind of empty, half-hearted worship actually is the most offensive to me. It's the most destructive to you. It is the most... We see it. It's why so many people, particularly the young, are turning away from the church. Because we have tolerated a religion that allows us to oppress people, a religion that allows us to to have half-hearted commitments, a religion that allows us to call that which is evil good and celebrate it in our life. And so Malachi's not for the faint of heart. Now here's the other ironic thing about it. And this is the thing that God says, this wearies me. This tires me out. This is what Malachi is all about. He says, you do all this, you do this half-hearted worship, it leads to the oppression of people, it leads to immorality, it leads to broken, it leads to society falling apart, family falling apart, all these kinds of things. You rationalize those things that are evil, you call them good, immorality, sexual chaos, okay, that we just celebrate, we watch on Netflix, we, do, we, just, we glorify, we say, oh, this is good, I need to see this, it'll make me happy, make me fulfilled. And then we start reaping the fruit of that, which is pain and division and hurt. And then we blame God. So the last part of it, we do all this while expressing ingratitude towards God and blaming him for injustice. So we say, God, why is the world like this? Why are these bad things happening? Why is our society so messed up? Where are you? Why don't you do anything? And God is saying, return to me so that I can renew you, and through your renewal, bring renewal. Now, here's the the glorious thing about all this. Our God is a God of renewal. He wants to renew your life, okay? He's not stingy about it either. He, He is slow to anger, abounding in love. He wants to pour out blessing. I mean, real blessing. I'm not talking about Cadillacs and big bank accounts. Real blessings from heavens he wants to pour out on you. But, but it, it's got to start with a returning to God and wholehearted worship. Let's take a look at what Malachi says about returning God. A question, how shall we return? He says this, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. He said, now here's what you need to understand, first of all. This is not about God messing up. This is not about God being God or that he's changed rules or he used to be mean, now he's nice, or he used to be nice and now he's mean. He says, I haven't changed. He says, that's one of the reasons you're not consumed. He says, you keep doing these things in rebellion to me and and I tell you what, if you were God, I mean, you wouldn't still be standing here. This is one of the reasons I'm glad I'm not God because I I mean, I get frustrated in traffic. I were God to be blasting SUVs out of my way. It would not be a good thing. But God says, I am God. What what does that mean? I'm slow to anger, abounding in love. I have patience that lasts generations and hundreds of years. And, and 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 I am going to fight to bring renewal in your life. He says, that's why you're not consumed. He says, from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and you have not kept them. Now, this is the other point of encouragement I just want you to hear, is that this is nothing new over the sun. One of the things I've been doing a ton of, really over the last year, has been reading a bunch of Christian history, going back, particularly the early church and what happened and why the early church started with a, a group of 120,000 people. And within 300 years, half the Roman Empire. Millions of people were professing and following Jesus Christ without a political movement, without any money, without any uh, written scriptures for a big part of it, without any church buildings. What happened there that, that wove in there? And then what happened to knock that off? And what, what happened to make it watered down and corrupted and half-hearted? And what I found is that that is not a story that happened once. That is a story that happens over and over and over again in the history of God's people. That is to say, there's a group of people who find God, and they were so lost, they were so broken. God comes in to renew them. They live it, and then within a couple generations, get watered down. It gets gross. It gets kind of abusive. It gets kind of hypocritical. And then something happens. We're over here. A little group of people from the Book of Remembrance said, yeah, we're not going to do that. And a renewal movement happens. A revival movement happens. Something happens. And so here are a couple of examples. The crusade starts. Crusade's bad deal, right? Bad deal. Over here, St. Francis begins his movements of peace and love. Okay, you have another story over here where in America you had pastors and preachers in the South writing 
pamphlets about why slavery is justified and horrible racist things that would make us just go, up over here, you have an incredible group of Christian abolitionists, people like William Wilberforce, who are fighting for the liberation of all people. Okay, you'll have a, a dead, spiritual, empty liturgy permeating the United States, and then you have an Azusa revival in California. You will have a great awakening in the early part of America. You'll have a second great America. You'll have the, the Moody um, um, revivals that were in Chicago that, that actually caused to too much beer and bars closing in the city of Chicago, if you've ever heard of anything like that. And, 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 and then you have uh, um, the Billy Graham Crusades and all kinds of history just in our country. And if you go through the history of the church, you have all kinds of times where the church gets this half-hearted worship and they start becoming abusive, they start becoming broken, and then a renewal comes in. Let me just ask you, my friends, again, the question I started with, is anybody feeling the need for a renewal today? a returning to God, to the song of Jesus Christ, the Savior, that we take what we spent the whole last year learning last year, the Sermon on the Mount, as though those are actually commands and teachings for us to live today. That Jesus gets our first and our best. Well, that's what Malachi is calling us to. Let's take a look at what Malachi says. He says this, return to me, and I will return to you. Can I get an amen? amen. Anybody need God to return to them? Anybody need a renewal? Anybody believe that this church, our church, the church of the Chippewa Valley, the churches across the United States need God to return to them again? The spirit of God that'll come in power, that comes with miracles, who comes with healing, who comes with renewal in the deepest way that changes who we are and how we live and what's important to us, okay? Just, just, th th this is what God's calling to us. We need to return. And God says, if you return to me, I'll return to you. I'll run back to you. This is the father running down the road to meet the prodigal son who throws a celebration, who covers his faces with say, kisses and says, my son was dead and now he's alive. We have to rejoice. Kill the fatted calf. Bring out the best because God always brings us his best. That's why we bring him his best, by the way. Watch this now. Okay, but you say, now remember, this is this whole formula where they, God asks a question, they ask a question, God gets some attitude. I know you've never given God attitude, but I have. Here's them giving God some attitude. How shall we return? What do you mean by that? Okay, now, now here's the thing that's really strange about the answer he's about to give, because it's not what you expect, okay? Because what he's going to do, he's going to drill down and give a specific example that is an example of the condition of his heart. And this is something he does over and over again, this example in Malachi. Look at this. He says, he doesn't answer, but he asks them a question. Will a person rob God? That is to say, will you take from God that does not belong to God, that doesn't belong to you? Okay? Because here's just a thing you need to understand. You know what belongs to God? Everything. Okay? God isn't interested in like 10%. 20%, 90%. God says, I am Lord, I am owner, I am, I'm in charge of everything, okay? Everything belongs to me. And when we have a perspective that God gets our first and our best, that's us just not doing God a favor or God saying, thank you so much for helping me out. This is us returning to God, which belongs to him. That is an attitude called stewardship as opposed to ownership, Okay, and so when God comes back and says, well, you rob from me, okay? It's all about offering. What am I giving myself to? Because here's the deal. If you're giving yourself to anything but the true God, you are robbing God. Okay, now watch this, okay? Again, some of you say, why are we doing Malachi? It's such a hard book. This is why, watch this. Will a man rob God? You are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you? What are we doing? What do you mean by that? Some of you probably just asked that question. He says, in your tithes and contributions. So he comes back and he uses this, listen now, specific illustration to express a much more profound indication of the heart, okay? So what's a tithe, what's a contribution? A tithe is this understanding, ancient principle in the scriptures that begins in this foundation that God owns everything. And to regularly and routinely reassign, realign ourselves to the fact that he is owner of everything, we come regularly and routinely and we give God our first and our best in the form of a tithe. So we give 10% of what we have back to God. Now this is a spiritual practice. This is a practice that people balk at and so hard. Why? Well, because it's our stuff. 
And, and I kind of like my stuff. We also like this because you understand, I need my stuff because I got to take care of myself. And so tithing is this opportunity to come back and say, okay, God, you called me to do this. I'm putting you first. I'm giving you something that matters to me, something that costs me something. I'm going to give you something that expresses my trust that you are good and you are powerful and you will take care of me. It is an opportunity for renewal. And it is an individual example of so much more that I look at my life and I say, what other parts of my life do I want to give you my first and my best? Okay, now this has been a big problem in the book of Malachi because he says it in a couple other different places because for them, the first and the best would have been an issue of bringing an animal sacrifice or an offering to God. And so this is a teaching, we'll see in a minute, that goes all the way back to the Old Testament where God says when he established them as a people, he says, listen, you're gonna forget that I'm God. And you're gonna forget that I'm the source of your provision. You're gonna start to worship other gods. And listen, Boy, you think, boy, that's a lot for God to ask. It's nothing compared to what the false gods in your life will demand from you. They will demand your attention. They will demand your devotion. They will cost you way more resources. They will ultimately come for your children. And they will take from you, okay? God is a God who loves to give to you. You'll see that in just a minute. He says, so from the very beginning, you're going to forget that. You're going to forget the very first thing that God revealed about himself, which we're going to start studying in Genesis, that he is good and that he is the source of all things, okay? He says, you're going to forget that. So I want you to do this practice, that whenever you have your, your males, he says, I want you to take your very firstborn, the very best male you have from your flock, and I want you to give that to me, okay? Now that's going to be the healthiest, that's going to be the best. That's going to be the most valuable. I want you to give that which is most valuable before you do anything else. I want you to return that to me. This is an act of obedience. This is an act of worship. And this is, this is healing to your soul because it says, God, I'm going to trust you in this. He says, when you do this, you center yourself on God. We do this not only through giving the, the actual tithe, the finances, but we do this by choosing to put the scriptures bigger in our life, by putting God's principles better and more central in our life, but making prayer a bigger thing in our life. When we reinvest in the spiritual principles based on a heart that says, I need God, I want him to be first and best, it changes everything. So isn't it interesting how he answers that question? He says, he says, well, he says, how do we return to you, God? He says, will you rob God? You return by giving me your first and best in all things. So watch this. He says, you are cursed with a curse. Look at the very next thing he says. For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. He says, the whole group of you, you're doing a half-hearted thing. You're giving God what's left over because this is what the, they did. This is what he's talking about earlier in Malachi. He said, eventually the people started saying, you know what? Okay, we just had all of our, all of our sheep, all of our goats, Supposed to give that really good one to God. That's set aside for God. It's in separate. It's going to go and we're going to offer it. You know what? Boy, that's a valuable one. And that one's going to make a lot of goats. You know what? Oh, look at this one. This one, not as good. Let's just switch those up. I'll just give second best. I'll give what's left over. I'll give, 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 give a little less. And then, so, oh, this one. Oh, look at this one. It's got a broken leg and it's blind. It's going to die anyway. Let's just put this one over there. And what I will give to God is what I can't use in. It was kind of like the goodwill approach to God. God, I will give you what I don't need, what I don't want, what I'm not going to rely on, that, that isn't going to cost anything. Can I get a tax receipt for that? <laughs> Too close to home? You know, I wonder how faithful we'd be giving to giving in this country if we didn't get tax benefits for it. If we would just do it for love of God and obedience to God and because we just want to make God first and best in our life. And so, so they started doing this. And this is what, what Malachi says to it. He says, cursed is the cheat. Notice the word cursed there. Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable sacrifice and offers God a wounded, lame, or bland sacrifice. He said, would that go with your governor? He said, if you owed someone a sheep and you brought that sheep to it, would they say, forget it, dude? That's, that's wrong. That's, you're given second best. You've promised me a quality thing and you've given me this. He said, no one would accept that. He said, should I, the Lord, accept this from your hand? And that, think about that. How often is our approach to God like that? God, I got time to do so much. I watch the shows. I do the stuff. I got all my agendas done. I really don't have time to pray. 
Well, they don't have time for your word. Well, they don't have time to get in community. They don't have time to serve, okay? I, I, I'm just gonna push this all back and give you what's left. And so the, the question, how do you return? You return by returning. You return by coming back to first things, foundational things that make God first and best in your life. If you don't, you put yourself as a curse. And, and again, my friends, just hear me clearly on this. Malachi makes such a big deal about this, not because you know, uh, he, he's worked up or he's hyper-religious or anything like that. He wants us to understand that half-hearted religion, particularly the kind that has good theology, good practice, but it's, it's not who we are. It's just on the side. It's a little in fire insurance for someday we're going to die. It, it, it's something that we, we follow Jesus as long as he makes my life better. The, the Jesus life improvement gospel, right? That is a curse. It drives God from you. It, it makes us a, a hard-hearted, cruel, hypocritical, pharisaical people. Because here's the deal. You can actually say, okay, I guess what I need to do to be right with God is start to tithe. And listen, I think you should tithe. I, I think he's going to see in verse that, that, that he says this is something that we're supposed to do. It's an act of obedience. But only if it's an act of worship. Only if you come back and say, God, I do this because you are good and I trust you. You have always given me your best. I give you my best. I do this before anything else, first and best. If that's your heart, it becomes a blessing. Even tithing can become a curse. Later on, Jesus Many, many, like 400 years later, he's confronted the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he's basically calling them out as hypocrites. He's basically, in the spirit of Malachi, it's called the woes of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And you want to read something hard-hitting, this is the thing when Jesus started saying, I think Malachi was going in heaven going, whoa, Jesus, dang, you know? Because Jesus unloaded on this curse-laden, empty religion. He says, you hypocrites. He says, you clean the outside of the cup, but inside you're full of rotting bones. He says, you emphasize what's on the outside, the show, but inside you're empty. He says this. He says, you will tithe. You get so hyper about the rule of tithing, the legalism of tithing, the image management of tithing, that you will go to your cupboard and you will, you will take out all your spices and you will take 10% of every little thing. And make sure everything, you'll get hyper-legalistic about it, all hung up, but your heart is far away from me. And your heart is far away from my compassion. He says, you tithe the smallest amount of your spices. He says, but you neglect the weightier matters of the law. Mercy, love, justice. This is an echoing of Malachi. This is, gee, you got the idea, you just read Malachi that morning and said, Wow. And he saw it in the hearts of his people. And listen, this was not just the Pharisees. This is not just us today. This happens over and over again. It is amazing how many movements of God that were powerful, life-giving renewal become legalistic messes. Let me give a couple of examples. You could talk about the Puritans. And the word Puritan, someone calls you a Puritan, you say, what? You get offended. Originally, Puritan movement was a pietistic movement filled with love and goodness and joy and eventually became this oppressive thing. You can look at any kind of movement. There's a group called the Anabaptists. When the Anabaptists started, man, they were this incredible group of love and inclusion and, and just this movement. They suffered terrible persecution and eventually they kind of became the Baptists, not always known for their tolerance. I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but, 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 but this is the thing. Every movement of God goes through this thing where it needs renewal. And so, so, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees needed renewal. One of the, the beautiful things we don't notice in the scriptures in the book of Acts is that many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees became followers of Jesus. They actually are people who said, you know what, he's just right. And, and they came to Jesus and they experienced that kind of renewal because they wanted to remove themselves under the curse. Because half-hearted worship, Jesus on the side, every now and again I show up to church, man, that, that's actually gonna, gonna that, 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 that's some of the worst thing you can do for your soul. Go, he goes on. He says, he says, test me in this. Okay? Not just the tithe, certainly the tithe, but not just the tithe. He says, test me. He says, and therefore, put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. Test whether or not that I'm good and that I love you. And I, maybe I don't give you everything you want. I may ask you to change your dreams because there are never good dreams for you. I have different dreams for you. I may not, you may not do the thing that you pray and you get exactly what you want the way you want because that's what prayer is about. Prayer is about aligning our hearts to what God wants. But, but test me to see that if you put me in the center of your life again, you're going to discover goodness. You're going to discover provision on a deeper level than you could ever imagine. This is the only place in the scriptures where we're told to test God. 
It tests God in the renewal of these disciplines, of this practice, starting with this thing of tithing, because for some of you, it's just, if it's money, you're just shut down. Let me, let me just say this. If God doesn't have your money, he doesn't have you. I mean, if he doesn't have your money, that's your idol. There's a wonderful story about Sam Houston, who uh, was founder of Texas and all that, but he was getting baptized one day, and a, a guy he didn't really trust wanted to hold his wallet while he was getting baptized. He said, no, nah, God's going to baptize me and my money as well. <laughs> But that's this whole principle of giving and offering. It comes back to this thing of saying, listen, I'm going to give this to a string attached without trying to get anything, trying to get influence, my name on a building or anything like that. I'm going to give just because it belongs to God and it recenters me. This is the thing you're going to find out about God in all aspects of life, whether it be serving or, 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 or uh, giving or helping the poor, anything. You cannot outgive God. You cannot. Because he says, just, I, I'm waiting to pour to you. Look what he says. He says, test me, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing um, until there is no want, no need. See, you think you know what you need. You know what you want. God knows what you need. And when you trust, okay, God, sometimes what I need is hard, and sometimes what I need is no, and sometimes what I need is something taken away, okay, but I still trust your goodness. I trust your ability to give me those things that I want. This is a God-centered life. The, a, a God idolatry life is, God, I know what I want. I got these plans. This is the thing. Here's the plan. You got it, God? Okay, bless it. My agenda, my timeline, my thing. And then you don't do it. And you're like Dave in that introduction, which is kind of a bummer, that introduction. I don't know, it's kind of downer. But good, captures Malachi, right? This idea that I'm giving up God because I tried just a little bit and didn't get my thing. And now, where's God? Why is us? Uh, uh, and just go on. And, and, and God says, what he said in Malachi is that just wearies me. You make choice after choice after choice to make your life just ineffective and, and, and broken. And then you come back and say, why do you let this happen to me? <sighs> that wearies me. It's teenage kind of stuff, right? Okay. So he goes on. All right. So he says, robbing God. Now, now, now here's what we need to understand. The principle of first fruit. And that's what we're talking about here. And, and this is not simply about tithing. This is simply not about giving. This is about every aspect of your life. And it's simply this. You set apart. Now set apart is the root word for holiness. Did you know that? That's what the essence of the word holy means. Tim, by the way, gave an amazing sermon about this this summer. Our whole teaching team rocked it this summer. Did they not just rock it? Holy cow. So yeah, let's give it up to them. I'm going to go away more often. It worked really well, I think, for everybody. <laughs> but here's the deal. Um, this incredible thing. This is what holiness means, right? Holiness means set apart for something special. Set apart for that which is not ordinary. And when we say, okay, this gift I'm giving, this time of service, this time of devotion with God, this time in community, I am making it a priority. And it's costly, it's hard, but I'm setting it aside as an offering to God. I'm making it holy and special. Okay, it's not like religiously weird and mystical. It's just important because this is important because God's important. Okay, he says, set apart to the Lord all the first opens the womb. That is to say, the first thing born from the calf, first thing born um, from the, 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 the goat, all that is set aside to the Lord. All the firstborn of your animals that are male shall be the Lord's. So he says, bring to God the first and the best. This is the principle. This goes back. And so here's the deal. Bringing first fruits is an act of worship. That's what an offering ultimately is. It's like, okay, I'm offering something. It's not a transaction. If you make it a transaction, it's just really offensive to God. Okay, God, I'm bringing you this thing. How are you going to bless me? I'm going to bring you this. Are you going to give me seven times back in return? I'm giving you this thing. Now, this thing I'm praying about, you're going to make that happen, right? You're not making a deal with God because God is saying, yeah, Where'd you get that thing? Oh, you gave it to me. Oh, so you're giving back to me what I already gave to you? Yeah, kind of. It's kind of like my kids when they were kids. Uh, about five or six or eight or something like that, they started really getting into buying me Christmas presents. Guess who paid for those Christmas presents? <laughs> they didn't. They got a job. You know, this is great. And, and, and so, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. We do that with God. We say, God, I've given you so much. God said, you haven't given me anything. Everything you had came from my hand. I'm the one who's the giver here. That's why God never owes us a thank you. 
Never owes us praise and worship. Never owes us adoration because everything comes from, we're gonna see that in Genesis. When that's our perspective, we say, I'm giving this back to you, God, because it belongs to you and this centers me. I am giving because it's a benefit to me. I am giving it because I need to give to you because you are so worthy. And I give it with love and I give it freely. I give it joyfully and I give it with a cheerful heart. Do whatever you want. And that kind of giving, that kind of giving God just pours his love into. He pours benefits that go way beyond anything materialistic, anything earthly. He says, this act of worship that offers God, look at this, my, my leftovers and what I can spare. My first and my best in all things. In my time, in my attitude, in my attention, in my love for people in my, 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 my beliefs, in my finances, in, in how I spend my time, in every aspect of my life. Because here's the deal. He is Lord. I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. I belong to him. Book of Colossians says, we worship Christ Jesus, who is preeminent, gets first place in all things. And tithing, for one, is that thing of me coming back and saying, I'm giving this back to God. Okay, and so this is the principle of first fruits. This was what it taught in the Old Testament. This goes back to Exodus, which is exactly what Malachi is referring to. He says, when the time comes, your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say, by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. It's as simple as this. So, so a guy who's been offering the best for years, his son's about to take over the business. He's getting older. He comes, Dad, I got to talk to you, man. So do, do you realize, I've been doing a spreadsheet. Probably didn't have spreadsheets then, but I've been doing the spreadsheet. Do you know how much money we're losing on this first fruits thing? Do you have any idea what we could make selling these and producing these? We could be way up here. Listen, I got a plan. We got these other sheep, okay? They're secondhand sheep. They're gonna die anyway. We can't even sell them. What if we just offered two or three of those in place? Wouldn't that be better? And then we could do this other? And the father listens patiently. He said, son, this is what you need to understand. He said, there was a time when we were not a people. There was a time where we were owned by horrible people who had false gods, and those gods said it was okay for them to abuse us, to hurt us, to enslave us. And we were there for a very, very long day. But God sent a redeemer in Moses, and Moses led us out. We used to be slaves in Egypt, and now we're free. And what God has asked is for us to remember now that he is our God, and he is our Lord, and we belong to him. And that we are going to honor him in every way, because we used to be lost, and now we are found. He said, no, so, so son, there's just no way we are going to offer God anything but our best. Son said, got it. Now let me just ask you a, a, a question. Has anybody ever been lost here? Anybody here where there was a time you were without God, without hope, you did not know who Jesus Christ was, that you had made choices that had messed up your life, that sin ruled over you, that you were on a pathway to judgment and self-destruction. Anybody been there? You ever found, any of you found Jesus Christ? And you found in Jesus Christ that God did not send, you know, uh, an angel or just a prophet or some other perfect. None of that was good enough to make the proper sacrifice. God offered his son, his beloved son. He gave his first and his best for you and me. That's his example. He, he gave us which we could not we had no way to redeem and save ourselves. And so when we understand that there was a time that we were enslaved, we were owned by our sin, we were owned by false gods, we were owned by our passions and our lust and controlled by things, and our destiny then would have been destruction and death and judgment. And God so loved the world that he sent his first and best. Now our response in all things is to return. That's why it is such an offense. And that's the word Malachi uses for us to come and offer halfway. For us to come and say, you know, I, I'm really not taking this seriously, dripping in attitude. Listen, I'm not talking about people who are struggling to do their best. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who are not doing their best and sometime or another, they became okay with not giving their best. And they still think that honors God. And so Malachi, again, doesn't pull any punches. He comes back and says, how do you get renewal? How do you return to God? But coming back and offering God your first and your best. So what's your next step? Several next steps you could take. One, you could begin to tithe. Some of you say, you don't understand my finances are so messed up. Well, that's why you do Financial Peace University. That's why you go there and you learn God's view of wealth, what wealth is really for, 
Because if you have the world's view of wealth, wealth is gonna be oppressive, stress-inducing, marriage ruining, kid corrupting. But when you get God's view of wealth, it frees you to be able to do the things your heart wants to do and responding to God and needs properly. So, so maybe that, maybe some of you, you don't need finance, you're doing just fine, but you've given yourself excuse. You can have all kinds of loopholes. You say, well, on my tax receipts, I actually don't technically make any money. I've worked that out. So I guess I don't make any money, so I don't have to give God anything. Okay? You, you think like that. What, what's the low? How low can I go on this? So, so that's giving God wounded, lame, blame. Instead of saying, how high can I go? How can I, how can I honor God with tithes and offerings? Maybe for you it's another issue. We're going to do baptisms here in, in, in about a month. You know what baptism is? Baptism is a person who said, I once was a slave lost, now I'm found. And it's this burial rite. It's, I was dead in my sins, an old person was buried under the water, buried, and a new person rises to life. It is a picture of totally surrendering to God. And some of you have not been baptized. And you say, I need to learn about that. You need to go to the class, you need to learn about that, because it's offering God your first and your best. Your whole self is a living sacrifice. And that's the step you need to take. Some of you need to take seriously this thing we're going to be talking a lot about, getting in groups and community. You say, you don't understand, I have the time, be hassle. I've been in groups, not been great before. You know what? It's worth doing because this is where life change happens. You give to God by giving to other brothers and sisters. It's about asking yourself the question, how seriously do I take my faith in Christ? So let's pray together. Father, uh, thank you for your word. Thank you that you love us so much that you call us out, you confront us. It has been hard hitting. This book is hard hitting. So I just pray you just give us this ability to take a step back, protect us from defensiveness, from pride, from indifference, from callousness. Help us hear the Holy Spirit. Today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your heart. Help us, Father, take steps in obedience. Help us take steps to be baptized, to get in groove life, to do financial peace, to, to do emotionally healthy, to do the things you want us to do, to begin to tithe to begin to start offering God our first and our best in all things. Not as an act of religion or legalism. It would be better for us not to do it than to do it out of a sense of rule or obligation, but rather as an act of worship, as an act of obedience for your pleasure, just because we love you. And just an expression of saying, once again, you are not part of my life. You are my life. And, and I want to be a living sacrifice, give everything to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.